Um, welcome again. I think I met a few of you yesterday. And uh, give me a second. Let me just... <laughs> it's my one second of meditation. Thank you. Okay. How many of you guys have heard this or seen this story happen? Someone from security walks in and says, Hey, look, you've got to protect your work, application workflows. Right? And everyone's in contact that. Everyone might have seen that for their own apps. Certainly seen it for other app teams, right? And the different ways that people respond. I've seen a few of those as well. And I definitely see this, which is like, OK, I'm just going to go take a holiday. I'm going to ignore this for a few months, and let's see what happens, right? Please don't do that. Uh, ah, encryption. That's easy. I just like, there's something I figured out. I could just create a tunnel, you know? You need, you need keys for that. Oh, but they need keys to talk to my app. Let me just push the keys and, you know, self-sign them, put them on an S3 bucket, be done with it. Happens a lot. Way more than you think. And if you give options to an application developer who is under pressure to get something released quickly, they're going to take the shortest path. Right, the quickest path. Try a service mesh. And first of all, generally, when people think mutual TLS in this community, how many folks instantly go, OK, that means service mesh? OK. Well, that's actually not bad, because usually most people go that. And by the way, I think that is a genuinely legitimate opportunity. There's been a lot of work that's gone into really characterizing the key elements that you need for security and packaging them into a deployment mechanism that works reasonably well at scale. The challenge is always usually like, OK, look, it requires additional thinking, additional work, additional overhead. Um, when people think service mesh, they generally think proxies, sidecars, node proxies, some other form of proxies. You do have proxyless options in service mesh as well. Um, but there are usually some level of um, work involved. And also with the service mesh, it's not just the fact that you deploy a service mesh and suddenly you get mutual TLS. You do have to pay attention to what's happening there. When your uh, sidecar proxy starts emitting errors saying, hey, unable to process certificate error, don't ignore it. Right? Uh, there is, there's a lot, for example, I've, you've probably seen many of my talks over the years around how do you enable MKLS with Istio or Envoy or various sort of elements. My, you know, it was, I was part of the team that helped, uh, uh, part of my team helped build external authorization in Envoy back in the day, right? There's a lot of work that's gone into technologies like Spiffy, how it's implemented. Lots of best practices there, but not everyone follows best practices. A lot of folks um, still use a default service account for everything. So it defeats the purpose if you can't assign a different identity to every workload. If you give them all the same identity, then everything is, you know, what's, what's the point of having fine grained zero trust security? So uh, this is genuinely a valid option, highly encouraged. There is a cost associated with that learning. Um, resources, and so on. And the fourth option that people do consider, uh, even in the presence of service mesh, I've worked with a number of banks where they have a very sophisticated team that's trying to deploy a service mesh, but there's a number of app teams going, that's fine, I'm just going to build all this like spiffy identities natively into my app. And then they start digging into it, and they dig into it some more, and they go, <laughs> Oh, the stuff, uh, maybe uh, I'm, not, I'm not ready for that yet, because there's genuinely uh, things to learn, right? So uh, oftentimes it ends up in panic again. Oops, what do I do? So those are usually the main options. And just in a curiosity, like option C versus option D. How, how many folks look at option D and go like, maybe I could put a little app, but I don't? And yeah, exactly, right? So it's, it's, it's sort of there. It's, it's doable. But 
here's, here's something that will help make this easier to think through as we go forward into the future. This is where HTTP is going. It is here today. HTTP 3 was a standard as of last year. It uses a new transport protocol called Quick, which is a standard as of two years ago. HTTP 3 says there is no more HTTP. There is only HTTPS. So in the past, uh, part of the patterns that people have used is, hey, uh, in, including for service meshes, is why don't you just send HTTP from your application? We can intercept that in the proxy and then send HTTPS from the proxy out. In the new world, there is no more HTTP, only HTTPS. So HTTP3 says you shall provide TLS. That TLS is built into the transport layer that H3 uses called Quick. So TLS has been taken and implemented as part of the protocol exchanges. Benefit of doing something like that are things like performance. If you imagine things like a connection handshake with a TCP SYN, SYN ACK, ACK, followed by a TLS client hello, server hello, and then exchange traffic, the benefit of something like Quick is that you're doing your, if you've already spoken to your peer prior and the session tickets are still valid, you will be exchanging traffic in the very first packet. And that's a huge win from a performance and latency perspective, right? But the challenge is now TLS is part of the protocol. It's also an opportunity. And it's a huge opportunity because taking this, we are in 2023. TLS has been around for such a long time. It should not be something that is hard. It should just be part of the stack. But it does make a lot of us in this community have to rethink our architectures in a, in a good way. Because it's no longer the case where you can just say from your application, I'm just going to send unencrypted traffic, and someone else can look at my packets and figure out what to do. Because now your traffic will leave your application encrypted. Secondly, uh, and by the way, you can have proxies in the path of H3. There's work that's going on on H3 uh, UDP-based proxying, but that re requires the application to still send encrypted traffic as a capsule typically, and with sort of an outer wrapper that the proxy can take, take a look at and send it to the destination. So the proxy will have less visibility. And this is intentional from an end-to-end -end principle that we generally follow. So given all of that, um, the other question we want to ask yourself is the concept of identity. If TLS is mandatory, that means you need a certificate. TLS works with certificates. So, uh, where do you provide that identity? Do you pick a fake identity, like a self-signed, and put it on the application, and then have something else in the proxy? My general um, stance on this is every application needs to have its unique and attested identity that talks to what that application is. A couple of the challenges we've had with having identities just delegated to a service mesh proxy in the past, but not in the application, is one, that identity gets fed into the mesh proxy, maintained there, but not passed through to the application. Usually it's in the memory, of the memory space of the proxy. Which means if you're trying to use that identity for validating what, the, what client identity is talking to you at the application, you, you, you typically can't do that unless you do some extra work on the site. Second is uh, if you're trying to use that identity for other purposes, signing code, doing other sort of work in the application itself, you don't have visibility. Third challenge, what if you're talking to something externally to, external to the mesh, something outside, right? How do you establish the trust from the application outside? So these are some of the challenges that people have had. There are sort of ways to work around that. I've worked with a number of folks to implement different approaches in production. But if you step back and look at all of this in, the, in this new context of where H3 is going or where H3 is today, because this is widely adopted today in the front end, just get every workload and identity. And I'll talk about why that needs to be trivial, but why that has become trivial in the context of 
uh, some of the products that make getting identities to workload just automatic, right? So bottom line on this is H3 is now made TLS mandatory. You don't have to, uh, it, it's just like, it's just part of the transport of, of, the, app, of the protocol. So here's the other approach we, we can look at. This is a new project that we just started. Uh, we started a few months ago in collaboration with the cert manager team. And specifically, this is an alternate approach of saying, yes, absolutely, service meshes are one way you can tackle this. Yes, it comes with typically some level of complexity, uh, usually some significant amount of resource utilization. But another way you could tackle this is, um, let, me, let me pause here. H3 is awesome because it builds everything into the protocol. The challenge with H3 is it takes time to update the applications. It is a new protocol. It works on UDP. It takes, you know, you, you need to understand now that TLS is mandatory. So your applications need to go figure out certificates. They need to figure out rotation of certificates. They need to figure out authentication, authorization, hopefully, right? And all of that takes work. So QuickSec is like, well, rather than having applications do all of this additional work, why not let applications and for the period that they're going to be transitioning, whether it's months, years, whatever, let them continue to use the same system calls, the same library calls they've been using all, all along. Regular H HTTP 1.1 or HTTP 2 calls. And let's plug in, like in, in some of the uh, language bindings, middleware with a very thin language binding that says, okay, look, you take your H1 call as you've always been doing, but the middleware converts it to H3 on the wire. So the application continues sending H1 as it normally does. And if it's, a, for example, in our examples, if it's a Golang service, you would be doing a HTTP listen and serve. And you'd still be doing a listen and serve, but now with QuickSec, and what QuickSec does is, in addition to listening to H1 and H2 on the wire, we are also making the application listen to H3 on the wire. And as H3 requests come in, they get converted to H1 or H2 up to the application. If it's a client, you'd be doing a client do. And now with QuickSec middle injected, essentially that request will go out on H3 on the wire, giving it better performance. And interestingly enough, there's other benefits around service discovery, automatic failover from a client side. So there's some very significant benefits. I'm gonna defer those for a future talk, right? But for now, just keep in mind that you could just inject this middleware, keep using your application as, as you were, and with that tiny little update, you now have the ability to use and consume H3 on the wire. So super simple, no issues whatsoever, and you don't have to wait years to get to this new platform. Now, what's the benefit? The benefit is, in the process of doing that, we also enable pluggability of a few optional components at runtime. One is all of the workflows around certificate provisioning, rotation, validation, verification, um, and on the identity part, with things like certificates, for example, we'll talk about how we integrate with Cert Manager, but specifically Cert Manager now has a CSI driver and the CSI driver, the storage driver, essentially mounts the certificate into the pod automatically with the spiffy SVID, and the spiffy uh, s verifiable identity is essentially a certificate that has the metadata associated with that workload. That certificate typically has a lifetime of one hour, so the certificates are rotated hourly. There is, um, and, and when you have short-lived certificates like that, you can generally, that's generally considered a better security approach than having things like OCSP, online certificate status protocol, or other, like CR, CRLs hardly anyone uses in practice. So this is generally a better approach and to deal with short-lived certificates. And QuickSec does all the work to make this transparent to the application. The application is still sending just regular HTTP 1.1 transactions. Certificates being rotated, verifying them, 
validating the CA, all of that's autom automated by QuickSec. Second plugin is authorization. Being able to say transparently at runtime, look, what peers do you want to allow to talk to this workload if it's a service? If you're a client, what peers are you allowed to talk to? Giving the controls in a very simple schema, but something that can be plugged in by external authorization plugins is something that, um, so our team had actually done in Envoy back in the day with external authorization and contributing that to Envoy. We're taking a similar approach where, look, uh, you have a variety of security plug technologies out there, they should be able to plug in. But in the, at the base, we have a very simple policy-defined architecture. And by the way, while we're at it, why not plug in observability too? We're processing, we're seeing the HTTP requests, so let's generate logs, let's generate some metrics, and you know, there's additional work we're doing for additional observability components, but why not do that as well, right? So that's the basic concept behind QuickSet. Let's make this super easy to use. Uh, TLS is just part of the transport. Don't worry about it. And if you're gonna do TLS, you're gonna do encryption just once typically in your stack. Just make it mutual TLS. Authenticate the remote side and authorize it. So that way you don't have to worry about like all of the additional things that you are not doing. And so that's part of the intent by QuickSec is if you're gonna do TLS, just make it mutual TLS and plug in the controls at runtime. So, um, when we built this, the intent was to make the application experience as easy as possible, right? So very quick, um, just to set up for what we'll be demoing, it's actually the same demo application um, we were talking about yesterday. And the con this is one of the Azure uh, microservice demo applications, a bunch of microservices. In this case, uh, these are all written in Golang, so we plugged in the uh, QuickSec middleware quite fairly easily, other languages are coming. And in effect, um, it consists of a handful of services, a book buyer microservice talking to a bookstore, which uh, originally was using HTTP 1.1, and that's talking to a book warehouse with MySQL at the back end. And what we're gonna show is essentially this application has had QuickSec middleware injected, essentially this uh, um, import of the QuickSec. And now that it is using HTTP 3 via QuickSec, how do you enable mutual TLS at runtime? So that's the quick demo I have. Sorry, quick demo. I, I keep using quick as pun, and it's like, should I, should I say it's pun intended? At some point you go, oh. Might be too early in the morning for jokes. Okay. So what we have in this cluster here, I'll come back and talk to the role of cert manager, uh, and specifically cert manager CSI driver Spiffy. So we have that running already in the cluster. We have some of the QuickSec provided add-ons for observability already running. Um, Prometheus, Loki, Grafana, standard stuff. And that's basically what we have running here. So I'm gonna go ahead and deploy the bookstore pods. Oh, two factor. So it's coming up here, yeah, fairly quick to start. You can see it's like it's already started. Um, just a single container running in the pod, nothing else. And now if we do a port forward to access the UI for the book buyer and the book thief pod, so let's just do a port forward. And if we go to the UI for this, Book buyer is able to access the bookstore. There's a count that's incrementing, saying, okay, look, there's so many books being bought. It's all being purchased from version three of the bookstore, which happens to be on HTTP three. You go to the book thief, which is a workload that is a compromised workload in your cluster. Maybe you have a attacker in your, in your midst you don't know about yet. Also able to access the bookstore. All of these transactions are going on, on one-way TLS right now because that's the default in H3. If you do H3, you're doing one-way TLS, but you haven't, 
it's not MTLS. So let's enable MTLS. To do that, we are making one change to the deployment manifest of the application. And the one change we're going to make is right here. Where it says MTLS enable, we're going to set that to 1. And when we do that, in effect, we're saying, look, get your auth, uh, auth config from this file, and uh, this config map, actually. And the config map that we have deployed has right now just one rule saying, authorize this spiffy identity, um, book buyer namespace, book buyer service account, right? That's the only thing authorized. We'll talk about how that trust is established, how that um, trust domain is established. For now, we're just saying within the cluster. This could easily span multiple clusters. This could easily have trust established with a pure service mesh if you want to as well. So let's go ahead and apply that. Oh, sorry. Okay, uh, and it's strictly speaking, it's not re required to restart the pod. It's just an environment variable, but if you assume GitOps, let's say this has restarted. So in effect, we've essentially restarted the pod. Now the policy should take effect. And uh, in effect, if you go take a look at Book Thief, you should see that this is stopped. I'll give it a second here to make sure it has. Uh, yep, and so Book Thief no longer works. If we go to Book Buyer, um, that should keep start uh, kicking, kicking in again and start working. There you go. So you should see Book Buyer working as normal. So the, essentially, this is a one environment variable saying enable MTLS rather than one-way TLS, and that's it. Nothing else to do. No, no other components in, in place. And so that's working. But let's verify that it's working. Let's go take a look at our logs. And if you go look at the logs, let's look at the, uh, I have typed out again. Um, I, I might need to do a port forward. Okay. go. So if you say app equals bookstore, which is the one doing the authorization, and if you go look at the logs here, you will note, let me make that bigger, you notice that now there is this um, log saying uh, accesses from, um, from uh, unauthorized Piffy ID. We are also providing a dashboard so you can see uh, book thief has dropped to zero. Book buyer has also uh, book buyer continues to work because it is authorized. You see the spiffy errors saying, look, there's a spiffy error here, authorization error. So you see the errors, and we also give some basic service graphs. Again, you guys typically have more sophisticated dashboards, but some basic service graphs showing book buyer continues to work, book thief has dropped, traffic here has dropped to zero. Right, so basic observability, which can be integrated with your own platform. So. Um, What's the, what's the takeaways here? So question, where's the mesh? Right? So MTLS, basic observability, super simple, pluggable um, plugins um, for various purposes. And these days there are a variety of ways to make your plugins in any language. They intend to enable uh, these different options. And so takeaways, don't be afraid of certificates. What you saw there was Cert Manager CSI driver, which automatically takes care of creating spiffy SVID sort of X509 certs with uh, trust established based on how you've set up the cluster automatically. Pod comes up, certificate is available. You can choose to mount it into the, applica into the application. If not, QuickSec takes care of all of that. Certificates are rotated hourly. 
app doesn't have to worry about it. QuickSec takes care of it. Your policies look at runtime, you say, do I want MTLS or do I want one-way TLS? That's it. Right? If you don't specify that, it's one-way TLS. And you can specify your authorized workloads. So um, I have a lightning talk just talking about Cert Manager. Uh, if you're interested, that I'll give you a quick update there. Bottom line, TLS is now mandatory. Let's just make it mutual. Let's make just 2023. Let's not. Why? Why is this such a big thing, right? Every every transaction, every access. Let's just do it. It's, it's as easy as this, right? So keep it simple. Uh, we're trying to take you. And by the way, the intent is I'm not. I'm not um, there's a lot of complexity in things like the data plane. What we are trying to do with QuickSec is make it as easy to use as possible. So the workflow from an application perspective is I'm doing a DNS lookup and I'm doing an HTTP request. If you have to troubleshoot this, that's all you need to go troubleshoot. Yes, if, if there's certificate errors, if there's validation errors, there's going to be logs emitted. Please do keep an eye on those. But the data path is as simple as, as can be. Right? So that's the, that's the takeaway. Um, keep it simple. If you can, join us. We have an evening event. Jetstack, who is our partners in helping build this, uh, doing an evening event. We're going to debate spiffy and identities in general. Come join us. That's tomorrow evening. And feel free to, uh, in fact, we'd love collaboration. We are at the very early stages of this. The intent is H3 is going to bring a lot, new, lot more capabilities. Let's leverage the power of TLS now being built in. And quick really now becomes the point at which security policies can really have their full power because that's where encryption is happening. Quick is going to enable the ability to dynamically change context, how you can have different streams multiplexed in a connection, uh, and all of that, the point of convergence is that quick layer. And what we are enabling here is at the endpoints, either the server or the client. It doesn't have to be both. Your client could be a web browser just as easily, right? But we are enabling pluggability of security controls. Let me take a question if you have a, yeah, go ahead, Alex. Just a couple of questions. Wait, wait, wait. Please. A couple of questions for you. So the, the first one um, would be, so I think what I've understood is that rather than having a sidecar in the container or just one on the node, like Waypoint and Ambient Mesh, we're going to go in process and then use a client library instead. So that Correct. makes sense. That seems a lot simpler. There's Correct. still that problem of the certificate provenance of, of the CA and the rotation. So uh, there's still a lot of complexity in yeah. this, just like Istio Ambient Mesh is going to have. So I think, what do you do when you have an external client? Great this question. Is a problem that I have. Great question. Right? Yeah. And I've considered mutual TLS, but to, to actually bootstrap it to the point where there's a trusted CA that both of them can obtain certificates from. What, what is Great. your answer there? That's part one. Yeah. Um, you want me to take that? Do you want to answer? Why don't you just ask part two as well? Again. Part two is why, is why are you enforcing quick when really the, the main value here is switching out sidecars for CSI? Yeah. So you could potentially get a lot more traction, or this, you could apply this to HTTP 2 and 1.1, yeah. because the main value here I see is just switching yeah. to CSI instead of a whole bunch of microservices to create the certificates. Great, great question. Uh, so the first part of the question is, uh, yes, when you have things outside of your trust domain, how do you enable uh, MTLS with those uh, other external? So in the policy schema, we have the ability to say, look, if you have spiffy IDs with a certain trust domain, yes, that's part of the same trust domain, they can be trusted. If you have external trust domains, one of the things we are adding is, and this is something we have in, in flight, is how do you inject external uh, trust with external trusted authorities, right? So in other words, uh, you can do that in Envoy as well today. But in Envoy, you can actually go in and specify, if you see this domain, here's the root of trust. So same thing, the intent is, Ultimately, there has to be a trust. You can't just arbitrarily say someone with a self-signed certificate, allow it. So uh, part of this is enabling the flexibility, but how it is implemented is going to be rooted in can you establish trust with that 
uh, remote uh, external device. So this is like a kind of federation. You would trust the foot, the, the, the Correct. thumbprint of that CA. Correct. And the client, remote client, would generate it. Correct. And we would validate that remote that that root of trust is established yeah. and, and valid, right? Before. Okay. And then you don't have that problem of the service mesh where. All the certificates need to come from the same root CA. Exactly. That's one of the limitations. Now, even in service mesh, there's integrations with external uh, providers to enable this. But the challenge there is it's sort of uh, it's usually constrained to the, the mesh proxy. If you have a proxy, right? Here, you, you're essentially building it into the app. Second question is in terms of, oh, why quick, right? Um, we actually uh, thought about this because there are actually solutions, middleware solutions that do this with traditional sort of uh, environments, uh, usually longer lived certificates or CSP, right? But there is a significant amount of benefit to helping move folks forward to H3, and there's a few other benefits to H3 which I haven't mentioned here. Uh, automatic service discovery, automatic client-side failover, and um, the performance is also better. So interestingly, we found that by H3 transactions with Quick, some of the simple benchmarks are being 30% faster than non-encrypted H1 transactions, right? So there's benefits there. And TLS being mandatory and built into the protocol, there's a significant amount of benefit as opposed to dealing with, okay, look, I want to tweak my TLS to 1.2 and then deal with the issues around session tickets that used to exist. So the intent is there's a lot, the H3 stack with Quick is a lot cleaner. So yes, there's a little bit of a, we are moving folks forward, but there's a significant benefit to it. Right. Thanks. Thank you. I think I'm out of time. I'll be around, so we can we can probably have further discussions. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. I'm afraid that's all we have time for. Um, <laughs> great. Thanks.